recording has started. All right, welcome back. So today we are going to discuss lecture eight. So this is regarding the MOS structure. And so this is metal oxide semiconductor. And today we are going to discuss about the electrostatics. So basically we are going to discuss about the MOS tester structure. This is a one step before we move to the MOSFET where we are going to have the real transistor structure. So the MOS cap is an essential component of the MOSFET. We are going to discuss that first. And this is a reference chapter. And uh, this is a recorded materials from last spring and Professor Asip Khan. All right, so this is the MOSFET structure we briefly show in the last lecture seven. And uh, here we have the terminals like the gates, which is metal. And then we have the oxide under the metal gate. It's like an insulator to separate the metal and the semiconductor. So the semiconductor here is a substrate, or we see the wafers uh, in the manufacturing. So this is a substrate. And uh, we are talking about the silicon here. So in this example, we have this N-type MOS, or for short, N-MOS. So for N-MOS structure, we will use the P-type substrate. But we are going to dope this source and the drain with N-type doping. And actually it's N-plus doping. Here's a plus means heavily doped. So heavily doped means the doping density is higher than the normal range. We talk about the normal range, let's say 10 to power 15 to, 10 to, to 5 times 10 to power 18. But the N plus is even higher than this upper limit. The reason is that we want to make the source and the drain more like a contact to interface with the metal interconnect. Because essentially, here we have those terminals. We are going to have wires to connect to those terminals. Those wires are the interconnect, as we discussed in the lecture two. We are going to build the interconnect, probably with copper. So we are going to have that to interface with the semiconductor here. So to make good contact, we have to heavily dope the source and the drain to make the resistivity of the silicon low enough to have a good contact. So here the key thing is that for the NMOS, the substrate is P-type. Okay, don't confuse. So this is the NMOS, and we are going to see why it's called NMOS later today, because eventually we rely on the inversion of the surface of this silicon be n-type when the device is in the on state. So normally the device is in the off state before you apply any voltage and then you have this p-type substrate. But when we really use the device in the on state, then the surface will become n-type and we will discuss why in the following slides. So that's why here this is called an n-type MOS. And when the source and the drain are ignored, and let's say if we only look at the structure in the middle, then we have this MOS structure. This is like a capacitor before we integrate the source and drain. So we're going to discuss about this MOS structure first today. And in the following lectures, we're going to discuss the MOSFET after we add the source and the drain. So for the MOS cap, if you look at the cross-sectional view of this structure, then you have this MOS capacitor structure. So you have, it's like a plate capacitor. You have two plates, one is metal gate plate. The other plate is a silicon substrate. And the oxide is an insulator uh, in between. So this is uh, the NMOS and the NMOS cap, because the substrate is P-type. Any questions here? All right, so then let's look at the MOS cap in more details. So here we draw the MOS cap in the horizontal uh, direction. So this is the MOS 
And again, this is a MOS, so as a p-type some substrate. And uh, first, let's look at the bound model. Okay, so here we show the bound model where we have the doping. So in this case, this is p-type doping, so we know it's acceptor. And the acceptor will give you holes, right? So this is p-type. So holes are the majority carrier in the p-type. So you have the free holes in the substrate. And then this acceptor, once it's give out the holes, and what is left behind is this negative charge center in the nucleus of the acceptor. So the center is negatively charged. So in total, it's a charge neutral. And uh, here, let's look at the equilibrium state, and where we define the, let's say, the gate voltage Vg is zero. So in the lectures today, we will always ground the substrate and uh, we apply the voltage to the gate. So the substrate is uh, the reference in this case. It's always ground and the voltage is applied to the gate and we call it Vg. Okay, so this is uh, the uh, equilibrium state, then nothing will happen. Now let's look at what will happen if we apply the positive gate voltage, Vg is larger than zero. So for example, here the Vg is 0.1 volts. So this positive voltage, you know, this is a capacitor. So this positive voltage is going to charge the plate of this capacitor, in this case the metal gate, with positive charge. So you see this positive charge here, that is induced by the uh, positive voltage. And uh, for a capacitor structure, you know, the capacitor needs to be charge balanced between those two plates. So in other words, you will have the same amount of the negative charge on the other side. So that means in this side, we should have the same amount of negative charge to balance the positive charge on the metal gate. So in the semiconductor, this is p-type, and we need to get a negative charge to the surface. So what will happen here is uh, look at this animation. So when you apply positive voltage, those holes, because they are positive charge, so this electric force will repel the holes away because you have positive charge from the left hand side so then this holes will be pushed away because holes are movable it's free hole so once the holes are move away basically sink to the ground then the surface of the silicon will become negative charge because the nucleus of the acceptors will have negative charge but those are fixed, non-movable. So this is the surface of the silicon, which is negatively charged by the acceptors. And then we have the charge balance across the capacitor. And we call this depletion. Okay, the surface of the silicon now is depleted because there's no free carrier. So then this is like the depletion. And this is the depletion width, WD. As we further increase the gate voltage, let's say, to the 0.2 volts, you get more positive charge on the metal plate. And then correspondingly, we need more holes, sorry, more negative charge uh, on the other side. So the holes need to be further pushed away. So this is what happened. So then the depletion width is going to increase. So we can keep this trend with the higher and higher gate voltage. Then you're going to push more and more holes away. Then the depletion region will become larger and larger. And then we well, have certain points here. This is a critical point. And we call it a threshold. So in this example, for example, here now we have 0.6 volts. You have so many positive charge on the metal plate. 
Then on the other side, if you only rely on the holes being pushed away and then left behind the negative charged acceptors, but the amount of negative charged acceptors is limited here. So you have to induce more free electrons to the surface to balance the positive charge. So this means the surface is inverted from the p-type to n-type because now you have the electrons to the surface. So this is the, the threshold condition where the surface has this strong inversion from the p-type to n-type where you have a layer of free electrons induced at the surface. Then you may ask why not we further, let's say, move away the holes here so you have more negative charge from this side to balance this. So to be effective to balance the oxide, you know, the distance matters. So if you rely on the holes to move away from here, then the negative charge will be very far away from the positive charge here. So that means this screening of the negative charge is not very effective. You want some charges close to this positive charge to basically screen the electric field. And then we cannot rely on those negative charge center far away. We have to induce the electrons to the surface to further compensate the positive charge to the metal gate. So that's why we have this inversion of the surface. Okay, so then this is the area inversion. Then the surface become n-type. So that's why this structure is called n-type MOS. Any questions? Then let's continue. If we further increase the gate voltage above the threshold, then this is at the threshold. Then above threshold, we are going to have more and more positive charge on the metal gate. As a result, we need more and more surface electrons. So you see here, you get more and more surface electrons to balance this. All right, so then let's look at what's going on using the band model because we like the band model. It will be more straightforward to calculate the relationships between the, let's say, the heat voltage versus the potential in the semiconductors. We're going to derive that later. So we prefer to use this band model. And uh, if you recall the lecture five, then when we talk about the energy band for the n-type semiconductor, it's something like this. We have the EF Fermi level close to the EC conduction band edge. So this is for n-type. And then for the p-type, we have the EF close to EV valence band edge. So then the question here is the surface of the silicon change from the p-type to n-type, then how do we change the band diagram to make this happen? So this p-type is uh, before you apply voltage, right? It's uh, the gate voltage zero, and then it's n-type is your gate voltage maybe equals to your threshold voltage. So this is at the surface. Of the silicon. So the surface of the silicon needs to change the band diagram from this P type to this N type. So how does this happen? All right. So if you think about this process, initially this is the P type as the surface. Now you have to become N type. So what you can do if you look at this animation is to move down the band edge like EC, EV by certain amount. Then your 
semiconductor become n-type. So here this EI is the intrinsic Fermi level. That is essentially the middle of the band gap. Okay, so let's quantitatively look at the shift of the band edge. This is before you apply the gate voltage. The surface is uh, E-type. And we define the distance between the EF and the EI, the intrinsic Fermi level, as this Q by B. And you can calculate what, what is Q by B here. So essentially, if you use the, let's say, the NA will determine, doping density will determine the level of the EF. And the EI actually is the respect to the NI, the intrinsic carrier density, right? So then you can use the equations like N equals to, you know, it's always N say exponential EF minus EC over over KT. So you can calculate what is EF using the NA. This is like what you have done, the homework. And then if you think about the intrinsic case, then this EI will correspond to the NI. So you can back calculate what is EI and the EF and then the distance between that, if you do the calculation, then it's about this kt over q natural log na over ni. So let's say this uh, phi b is our electrical potential. Then we add this q, then you will have the energy distance because energy is the q charge and the electrical potential. So here the phi b, Basically, the distance between the EF and the EI. This is in the P type semiconductor before you apply voltage, before you apply gate voltage. Okay, so now you want to apply the gate voltage as a threshold voltage. So this is a VG0. Now this VG equals to VT, the threshold voltage. So as we discussed, you have to push down the band. So here we define a condition for the strong inversion. Okay. As this strong inversion, we define the band edge like this EC shift by 2 phi b. And we call this band shift as phi s. And we will later define this as a surface potential because that is the potential of the surface of the silicon. And the surface potential needs to be pushed down by 2 phi b. This is defined as the strong inversion condition. And this will define the threshold. Or in other words, here, you know the, uh, let's say, the relative distance between the EF and the EV will determine the whole density. Right. And then at the threshold, if you look at the EF and the EC, the distance, this one will define the electron density. So basically, this strong inversion says that the whole density before you apply voltage equal to the electron density at the threshold. So the surface basically is strongly inverted to be n-type, as strong as this p-type originally, because the distance is the same in this definition. So any questions?
All right. So then let's look at the band diagram of the MOS structure when the VG sweep from the negative to the positive. So this is a band diagram. We have the MOS structure. And uh, let's look at the flat band condition. That is uh, when the VG equals to zero. This is the equilibrium stage. So the MOS uh, in the metal is only one Fermi level. So in the metal, as we discussed before, there's no band gap. So it only has one Fermi level in the metal. And then in the silicon, then this is a P-type silicon, so it has this EF close to the EV. And in this equilibrium state, as we discussed before, in the system, there's only one Fermi level. So the EF in the metal will be aligned with the EF in the silicon. And this oxide is a barrier. So basically oxide is a system where the band gap is very large. The band gap is very large. So it seems like a barrier for the electrons. And uh, in silicon dioxide, this band gap for silicon dioxide is about 9 electron volts. And the silicon is like 1.1 .1 electron volts. So this barrier height is like 9 times than the uh, silicon's band gap. Or in other words, the electrons are very difficult to jump over the oxide barrier. So that's why the oxide is insulating. The metal and the substrate is like a capacitor structure. The DC current cannot uh, move through the oxide. Okay, so this is a flat band condition. Everything is flat. And then if we apply negative voltage to the metal, and you have to recall the conclusion we had before, negative voltage will push up the band, and positive voltage will push down the band. So negative voltage push up the band, so the Fermi level in the metal will move up, and uh, correspondingly, the band edge of the oxide and the silicon will be bent, and will be bent up like this. And now, this is the p-type substrate. The holes are majority carrier. And we have discussed before, you have the slope in the band edge. Then the holes, like bubble, and to move up, so there will be more holes accumulated at the interface of the silicon. So that's why we call this is an accumulation condition for the holes, accumulation of the holes. Because here we have more holes to the surface. This is when we apply negative voltage to the gates. Now let's move to the other side. When we apply positive voltage to the gates, then positive voltage bend down the band. The Fermi level is pushed down, and the band edge all bend down. So then this is the first depletion because you have many holes in the substrate. This is p-type. You have hole as a majority. So this hole will again tend to move up, so it will be pushed away from the surface. That's why the surface becomes this depletion. But as you further increase the voltage, let's say beyond the threshold, then this band is bent, so bent. Okay. So the slope here is so large. It will make the EF close to the at the surface, close to the EC. Or in other words, here we have the N type. So that means here we are going to have many electrons induced. And you know electrons like water tend to move to lower potential. That means electrons will be occupying this surface. So this is when we have the strong inversion. So essentially, this band model tells the same physical process as the bound model we see earlier. But if you use the principle we discussed before, like the electrons tend to move to lower potential, like water, and holes, like bubble, tend to move to higher potential, then you can analyze 
what's going on in those different uh, conditions here. Any questions? All right. So let me stop.